I'll go ahead and call the meeting to order at 7.02. Could we have a roll call? Bill Brown. Here. Annie Adams. Shannon Brianek. Here. Kara Dudek. Here. Cynthia Hoyle. Audrey Ishii. Susan Jones. Jeff Marino. Sarthak Prasad. Nancy Westcott. Here. Looks like we might need one more for a quorum. So we can't vote on anything. We can just have discussion. Okay. <clears throat> Unless if somebody else comes and we could vote on something, but. Okay, um, next is approval of the agenda. Um, I was looking at our um, bylaws. We don't actually have approval of agenda on the, on the agenda usually. And normally I know at city council, we just have additions to the agenda. So I think in the future, we ought to just call it additions to agenda and then we won't have to vote on it if we aren't making any changes. Um, but since this is on there now, um, are there any additions to the agenda or changes? Nope. Okay, seeing none, could we have a motion to approve the agenda? Well, I thought we couldn't do anything. Oh, that's true. We can't, we can't do it. The only thing you can do is uh, adjourn. That's the only official stuff you can do. Okay, so we want to approve the agenda. <laughs> we'll just move on. <laughs> we can't approve the minutes. Um, public input. Is there anyone from the public who would like to speak? I think. We have two attendees. I don't see any hands raised. Okay, no public input. So new business. First is the capital improvement plan. Shannon was gonna make a short presentation on that. Hopefully people had a chance to at least kind of glance at it. Um, the presentation was pretty, pretty good overview, but yeah, go ahead, Shannon. All right. So, um, for the full presentation, uh, Tim and Will gave one to commit, uh, I can't remember if it was committee of the whole city council last week, and they'll be giving another one in the near future on the 21st, I believe. So mine is very abbreviated and I'm going to touch more on the projects than the budget and the funding, because that was really what they went into. So this is pretty high level. I didn't want to bog uh, us down with it. So, you know, definitely if there's questions, I can answer them, but I only have a few, like 14 slides. So, um, like I said, pretty high level. Do, do the thing. There we go. Can everybody see the, the title slide? Yep. Oh, cool, cool. All right. So, a lot of this actually stole from. Um, Will Kolchowski's presentation. So this is his slide. Um, whoop, too far. Uh, basically, what the CIP is comprised of, it's capital replacement investment yes. um, called CRNI, which also includes some operations and maintenance, which is you know general public work stuff. Um, it's for improving city assets, bridges, public facilities, lights, pavements, sidewalks, bike paths, etc. Um, comes from dedicated funding. Uh, the CRNI fund is a fund in itself. Uh, local MFT, state MFT, and the sanitary and stormwater fees. Um, that doesn't really pertain to a lot of what BPAC does with the sanitary and stormwater, but it's all lumped into the CIP as well. Um, and activities are project-based with some maintenance programs involved in, as well. So um, we have a new and improved maintenance and capital improvement schedule. Um, each year we're trying to re- um, not reinvent the CIP process, but make it a little better. Like last year was a brand new system. And this year we've expanded upon it, added more things. So we've had more projects. 
Um, different, we're going to try different techniques for uh, some of those projects. Uh, we're still working on planning an annual signal and street lighting improvement schedule, um, new sanitary and sewer maintenance programs. Again, not really a BPAC thing, but it is part of the CIP. Um, then expanding our annual road programs. Like last year, due to short staffing and COVID, we didn't do any oil and chip, any payment marking or crack sealing. So uh, actually right now, uh, Chase Hinton, our one engineering tech is pretty much those three are his babies. And in addition to all his other duties, he's putting those products together. Um, so stuff that really applies to BPAC is the transportation projects. And um, this year, uh, between uh, Tim Cow and myself and Andy Murphy, we came up with this, um, well, Tim was the spearhead and Andy and I assisted, came up with a prioritization criteria. Um, so we had a list of a bunch of things. These were the top categories, uh, major safety issues shaking out to be the top thing. You know, if there's a project that will solve a major safety issue, that's, you know, gonna take priority. Uh, then road classification. So like arterials like Lincoln, Florida, the very heavily used roads also will get um, a higher priority because they are used by so many of the city's residents. And then we go down to payment condition. Uh, project linking is if we can link um, multiple projects together. So we have actually one that started as a uh, simple resurfacing of one road that turned into resurfacing of three roads that all happen to touch each other. Um, funding assistance then comes into play. So like if we can get say an ITEP grant, that might actually bump a project up because we'd have funding. Unfortunately, um, we did not get an ITEP grant this, this year. Um, and also bus route age. And the farther down the list you get, a little more subjective it gets and a little more human involvement. Um, so the ones in the, the pink are the major ones that we really wanna to try to stick by for our current uh, system, just because it has, those three things have such an impact. Um, and so I pulled this right out of this, the transportation book. Um, this is the transportation projects using that ranking, a um, little bit of cost estimate that is very back of the envelope. It could be higher, it could be lower. A project could evolve like Lincoln Springfield started as a simple mill fill and it has become a lot more. Um, I'm not gonna go into every single one of these projects, but when I'm done, if somebody has a question, definitely feel free to ask. Um, so this is just a very high level map of the city showing where our current CIP plan program uh, road projects are. Savannah Green is the one that's off to the far east. Um, a lot of work going on Lincoln, got Florida Avenue in there. Um, so it's, it doesn't look like a lot in terms of the whole city, but it actually is hitting some major um, roadways in the city and some very um, in need of help. So this was also pulled straight from Will Kuchowski's presentation. These are the big ticket transportation projects. They have the biggest uh, uh, dollar attached to them right now. Lincoln Springfield, we actually just had that out to bid. Um, so we're working on getting that ready to go. It came in a little harder than anticipating, but COVID may play a factor in that. So um, that one's actually right in the can. Uh, Florida, I'm Lincoln Divine. I'll get actually more into these in the next few slides. This were just some nice pretty maps that Will had all laid out and I didn't have to make them. So thank you to him for that. Um, Florida Lincoln Divine, right now, uh, RPC has in their hands, they're doing a, a study phase with public input, um, seeing you know, what are good options, how we should proceed, and that will all go into our actual design. Like you know, their suggestions, the public suggestions. Um, it is great that they're handling that because they are very good at doing these studies. So uh, we should be having an update from them not too long from now, but I'm not quite sure when. Um, and on all these, I actually also put um, which master plans these projects relate to. So like Florida Lincoln Divine as both a bike and ped master plan in addition to the, um, the SCIL is the uh, report that looks at the countywide most crash intersections. And so Florida has one on there. So this will actually appear in a couple of them, I believe. Um, so uh, Lincoln Green to Florida, that is, right there, like south of where we'd stopping the Lincoln Springfield project, um, goes past McKinley and the forest and the sidewalks are really up close on that one. Um, this one, there was a fatality, if I remember correct, a couple years ago, right near the forest. And so 
Uh, we're going to do another safety study on this one first, likely RPC. However, it is funding and time dependent. So right now this is slightly nebulous. Um, it may also include a partnership with the U of I to do Pennsylvania Dorner because the U of I is not allowed to be a lead agency on a federally funded project. So if we get federal dollars, um, we have to be the lead agency and we can assist in um, getting their project done too. That is also very nebulous. Nothing is set in stone and it really is contingent on funding. So, and this one is also connected to the bike and ped master plans with the sidewalks and trying to get them pulled back from Lincoln Avenue. Um, Savannah Green, this is um, a little bike and ped master plan connected because it is a um, bus route. It's also a very neglected portion of the city. The Smith Road is falling apart. The alleys um, may as well be rubbleized at this point in some sections. Uh, what we're going to do is part of what I'm tasked with currently is put together a scope of what we want to uh, have requests for proposals on to see our options. So it may be, you know, like some from column A, some from column B. It's going to be um, hopefully better than it was. Um, but I have no idea what it's going to look like because it, it's going to be a lot of um, iteration. So this is all the other road projects that were on that first list with the ranking. Um, it's, you know, feel free to ask about them. I just didn't feel they were super exciting to go into. A lot of them are just simple mill fills. Um, just making the road surface better for bikes, cars, buses. Um, so like race Washington to California, that's actually in design right now. And I'm hoping to hear back from our designers um, by the end of the week to see where we're at. Oh. So, and then um, besides their scheduled projects, we're um, having our annual projects I touched on earlier. Um, we're using uh, our payment maintenance system from Aptech to help guide these, and then also to help us review in the future to get better iterations and make things better as we go along. Um, so this includes payment maintenance, road patching, surface seal, crack seal, uh, payment marking, you know, routine stuff that uh, hopefully once we get a cycle going, it'll be pretty much the same project in a different location in the city every year, just to you know get us on a cycle. Other projects, we also have sidewalk maintenance. Right now, Adam Shaw, one of our other engineering techs, um, that's his baby. He's got a list of sidewalks that should be fixed. And then we're gonna try to put together a cyclical project to really get sidewalk maintenance as an ongoing cyclical thing. I know we've kind of dropped the ball on it, well, honestly, since the entire time I've worked for the city, we've not really done a sidewalk maintenance projects, but we we want to do one again. Um, bike lane and side pass, um, if, if those are not part of a bigger project, they typically rely on funding like the ITEP grants. Um, so it's they can be hit or miss. Um, I'm sad that we didn't get the ITEP funding, but who knows, we may have another grant out there we can use. Um, or you know, if you guys really like the Baker's Lane path, um, what Carol's going to talk on later might be something you can suggest um, for the equity project, which I believe has like a $2 million pot of undedicated funding. Oh, hint, hint. <laughs> um, uh, other projects, miscellaneous traffic studies as are needed, traffic signal maintenance as needed until we get the actual like rolling traffic light program. Um, same with that's the, that's the annual signal program here in the next line. Um, we're still scoping it out, uh, nothing planned yet. Uh, same for streetlights. We do have a couple currently going streetlight projects, like there's going to be one on Matthews upcoming, um, but nothing in any kind of actual, like, let's fix the lights in the city that are bad. Just we're doing spot maintenance now. Um, so that's the end, very high level. Um, any questions? Great. Uh, any questions for Shannon? Uh, I'll just say uh, thank you, Shannon. That was a uh, a uh, great presentation. It was good to see that information. Um, how do you have, uh, do you guys create projects and then um, fund them as available? So I guess I'm wondering about the unfunded projects. Do you have a list of unfunded projects that are hanging out there? And then, you know, uh, these, these are the projects that, you know, rose to the top, I guess. But then there's, I would assume, a, uh, a fair amount of projects that are just waiting funding and our lower priority. So um, using our data and ranking, uh, this, this is where we started more deviating from the old way. The old way, I don't know if you saw any of those CIPs, it was just pages and pages of projects that 
most of them likely will never ever come to fruition. With these, we're really trying to focus, like we've got like, I think it's like 10 to 15 projects, like we do have money budgeted and it's, it really rely on if something else like ca catastrophic comes up or if funding gets pulled, like we try to um, kind of plan ahead, but not have so much in the can that we can never get to it and things just linger, so. Um, on the Florida Lincoln Divine section, I know that's been um, in our plants and had a lot of public support over the years. I think it was actually in the one to five year projection in the 2016 Bike Master Plan. So we're kind of at the end of that and it's good to see that um, probably getting going soon. So that 2.4 million was it? Does that include all this side paths? Kind of, I know it's a rough estimate. But Lincoln to Green is six million actually. Or you understand uh, no, Florida, Lincoln. oh, it's four point two million. Florida Lincoln to Vine, yeah. yeah and that, that does include the side path that goes along the president's house and over to Ray Street. And um no promises, but we are looking to see if possible to extend it all the way to Vine, but there's a lot of stuff in play once you get past race. Okay. And then um also I think there was a fatality there kind of by Orchard Downs probably like seven or eight years ago, at least. Um, that signal there, I, I seem to remember that that needed to be upgraded and that might be the responsibility of the U of I. Does that sound right? Uh, that traffic signal is actually the city's. And um, in general, for the course of the city, before um, Benny Gardner unfortunately passed, one of his projects was to start the modernization process. So um, that's a little bit behind. Uh, we are still going to do it. We just need to get everything lined up. And um, a lot of the Florida Lincoln Divine stuff is going to depend on what RPC comes back with. Like, I, I can't imagine this light won't be touched, but I don't know what, like, how it will be touched. So. And so they, ha I haven't heard anything about uh, them gathering public input or anything, but they'd be, do you know if they'll make a short presentation to us or just send us an email so that we can provide input on that? I am not certain how they're gonna gather the public input. I believe that's gonna be covered at our next meeting, um, right? Their, their first course of action was, uh, we gave them a huge data dump of this, the city's data. Um, they collect a lot of their own and are just kind of proceeding with um, some modeling at the moment, just to get like traffic flow, pedestrian, like in projections. And then I think it'll go from there into the uh, public input phase. Okay. Um... I have one more and then I'll take a break and let somebody else ask questions. Since we didn't spend uh, the budget last year on crack sealing and chipping and stuff, does that mean you'll be able to do twice as much this year? That is um, very much de time dependent. Like I was actually having a discussion with Chase earlier today about the payment marking because we didn't do one of those last year either. And um, normally we run about 40 to $50,000 on a payment marking project, but not having done one since 2019, um, if we could possibly double it, um, there is only one paint striper in the area of varsity. So it is also dependent on their schedule. So it's, um, while we would love to be able to do everything, it, it is actually a lot for just the two of us to manage. So. Yeah. Bill, this is Tim Cowan too, just to speak on that a little bit is a part of the CIP this year is in these, these annual programs that we want to essentially stop deferring maintenance on some of that is going to be a more holistic look to say <clears throat> you know for like a seal coat typically those are lasting three to seven years we're picking a target life cycle that we think is reasonable and trying to spend the reasonable amount of money on that so if we target five-year life cycles on the seal coating it's going to get us X amount of dollars per year. It's not to say that we might not do bigger programs one year versus the other, like you're talking about, as we didn't do one last year, or maybe we do a little bit more this year, but generally speaking, we're going to try to get that. So it's averaged out and it becomes a cyclical process where we're touching everything, you know, every five years, because that's really just a preventative maintenance treatment. Okay. Thanks. And, and then um, I did want to mention that on uh, Colorado, I think that's in one of the future projects. There yeah. is a short segment designated in our bike plan with uh, bike lanes. So I assume that would be incorporated into that too. Yeah, whenever we have like, um, say for example, the Vine and Washington project, 
um, before the design was finalized, I did actually go through the bike plan to make sure that I wasn't missing adding bike lanes or whatnot. And, you know, I did make sure to put the shares back on that one. Um, so it, it, we do review the plans before the final design, just to make sure that it wasn't part of something we missed. Okay. Other questions from people? Oh, and, mm -hmm. and let the um, minutes record that Jeff Marino joined us so we can now vote on stuff because we have a quorum. Yeah, go ahead, Sarthak. Uh, I was just going to ask if uh, Shannon, could you please send me the um, the presentation so that I can share it with Stacy as well. I think it would be she would like to see this as well. Sure. And the link in the agenda too has a lot of additional information. Um, has a bigger presentation. This is a nice. This is a nice overview. I mean, some of these slides are repeated. I mean, I stole them directly from Will's presentation because I was like, I wasn't going to reinvent the wheel. So no, that's, that's great. Really nice. yeah. Other questions? I didn't, I didn't realize that. Thank you for pointing it out. I mean, I'll send this one to you too as well because it is very short and to the point. But yeah. I didn't want you to be like, somebody plagiarized somebody. Yeah. <laughs> I just had a couple of quick comments, Bill. Yeah. Um, first of all, I just wanted to say that I think it's really smart the way that you're looking holistically at all of these programs. And I think in the long run, you're probably going to have time and money savings because things are working more cyclically. Um, and the question I had was, did you say that the, um, the Florida Avenue Lincoln Divine was a grant funded um, planning study? Yeah, we have, um, there's a variety of funds involved and I believe it's the Surface Transportation Fund that's paying for RBC to study at the moment. And there's been a recent change to the local match on those. It used to be, I want to say 50-50, I could be wrong, but now it's 80-20, which is much better for all the agencies who use that funding. Um, so that was recently changed by RBC, I want to say December-ish, I was at that meeting and I can't remember exactly when, but um, it is better, like, you know, that benefits Champaign, Urbana, Savoy, everybody in the Kuwats uh, region. So, I mean, and there's, I mean, there's more funding besides just that. And I'm, I think Tim could probably mention more on where the funding comes from, because that was really what he delved into uh, the CIP. Yeah, just to comment on that. So the study is part of a safety grant that was authorized for RPC to complete the safety study portion of this. Everything else is the surface transportation block grant program that uh, Shannon mentioned before, which as she mentioned, she's correct, used to be 50-50 to switch to 80-20, which is also more consistent with uh, normal federal uh, grant funding sources. And uh, that, that did pass, December sounds about right. Um, but yeah, right now, essentially the idea behind that one is an 80-20 split. It's programmed in the uh, Kuat's uh, transportation improvement plan for FY23 for construction. So the plan is get through the study phase between now and early next spring, then get through design in the next year and then construction would commence be right beyond that. So I have just one comment. Um, are the lighting studies, do they pretty much parallel the, um, the pavement studies and where they'll be performed? And I'm, I'm sure that getting them on rotation will also be important or is included. You want me to take that one, Shannon? Yes, please. I was actually just going to say that. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we haven't really defined this yet, but Again, this goes back to us looking at strategic asset management planning and, you know, something that we haven't done for a long time and looking holistically at these lights and, you know, what we're, what we're getting to is, you know, the assumption that everything's fine. And then we get to a point where we don't really have the options to make, you know, better decisions and things. So the idea is trying to look forward to plan for that. So part of this, you know, the, the initial scoping is really probably going to be more of like a asset management study type thing where they're going to come in and potentially do like a condition assessment of what we have um, to really kind of tie, you know, how far behind are we on this stuff? What kind of invest, you know, what, what kind of capital investment should we try to make in this? You know, are we talking about doing 10% of our lighting every year? Are we talking about trying to do 20% over the next 
10 years uh, going every other year or what we, we haven't defined that, I guess, to the question is, does that parallel the road programs? Not necessarily right now, but I think the other thing that we're trying to institute in the capital improvement flow program as we move forward is really when we get into the design of these things to look at all of our other facilities as we're touching these things, because it's going to be detrimental for us to come do a roadway project and then have a storm sewer failure. It's going to be detrimental for us to do a roadway project and have a bunch of bad sidewalk on either side or, you know, lighting that's well beyond its useful life and beginning to fail. So we're trying to, the idea is to try to incorporate that stuff when we look at these things, because quite frankly, roadways, they just, they're the big, they're the biggest portion of our public infrastructure. um, And all of these things relate to it. So when we touch those things, we should really look at, what else can we do while we're here? Because there's going to be an economy of scale to touch those things while we do that rather than doing independent projects for them. Okay. I was also thinking of the, the addition of lighting because I think that, that one bicycle uh, fatality in East, I think was East Main Street or near East Main Street this, I don't know, this winter. I think there was there was no there was very poor lighting there, and I think lighting it would be something where lighting would be have to be added. But would that have to be along with a roadway? Um, you know the, the the improvements in roadway and sidewalks as well as lighting, or would that be could that be something separate? It, it could be standalone. You know, generally speaking, the more we can lump together, the better. Um, but you know, part of this, you know, I guess you, you kind of hit a point that I missed on, uh, as part of the study, you know, it's probably looking at, you know, other areas where we don't have things similar to, you know, what we're getting, we're going through right now in regards to street trees. Um, we're trying to identify areas that feel, you know, they're either underserved or inequitable, um, things like that. So, you know, the idea is to try to start carving out some money, for other to dedicate towards other public infrastructure things that don't have dedicated revenue sources. Um, and I think, again, that's one where as we move forward, we get through the study and we identify some of these things. There may be some standalone projects in there that make sense to fund out of the CRNI uh, allocations that we have in this. And then some of it could also be something that has additional justification in the program that uh, Carol's going to present on after this. Uh, for equity and quality of life improvements. Okay, thanks. Welcome. Um, I have one about, um, I know we did a, the city did a road assessment uh, over the last several years and got it pretty detailed. And I guess it's an annual thing maybe um, where they have pretty detailed road conditions um, that were, collected by a a contractor. And I assume that helped inform some of the road projects. And we did something similar in the, well, actually it predated the pedestrian master plan. It was a sidewalk inventory and assessment. And it's included in the pedestrian master plan. Um, I was looking at it today. It's like, I don't know, a hundred page Excel file, basically probably 5,000 segments of sidewalks that are all ranked by condition, whether they need to be um, ground down or slopes bad and or sidewalk gaps was one category. I forget, there were a couple others. Um, Is there a way or um, is there any plan to try to use that to prioritize sidewalk projects the way we do road projects? And hopefully by doing that, um, be able to justify a little bit higher annual maintenance expense than the 100,000 that's usually budgeted. So RP is the uh, owner of the um, uh, sidewalk inventory, and it is something we do reference. Um, right now, um, our technician I referenced earlier, Adam, he's putting together um, a list of basically like someone calls in a complaint or writes in a complaint, and that between that spreadsheet and the RPC data, it will help him be able to basically link segments of sidewalk together. So it's much more, um, as Tim touched on earlier, it's cost effective to do big sections at once as opposed to little piecemeals here and there. So a lot of, um, so we wanna get kind of like how we're doing the annual maintenance where we're, we're making basically like a designated area. And that's gonna take a little bit of research. So like all of the data is gonna go into it. 
for us to be like, well, RPC has this area is really bad. Uh, Adam spreadsheet says this area is also real bad. Hey, there's only a block between the two. Um, let's try to link those. So maybe this year we are going to spend 150,000 to do all of this. And then maybe next year we only spend 75. Like um, we do want to average it out. So we're not, get, so we can catch up, but not put ourselves further in the hole in the process, if that makes sense. Like it's, um, so like the payment data came from Abtech and that really helped us go into this CIP and rank this, all the streets and put things together. And so pretty much the same thing will be done with sidewalks, just um, it probably won't be nearly as pretty or, you know, the data is not as nearly as nice as the Abtech data because you know, that's their thing they put together and make it very nice. Um, so, um, I don't know if Tim wants to say anything more on that than I've already said. Yeah, I mean, I would just resonate those things. Yes, yes, the inventory data is important, and I haven't had a chance to personally look at it in detail yet. Um, you know, the biggest challenge for us is always getting good data. So, you know, another thing that would be maybe worthwhile is reviewing that data and um, the time in which it was collected. You know, if if we've had a lot of changes or it's been a decade since we have that data collected, it's it could be that, you know, the data is not good for decision making. Um, could be that some of it still is and it's remained a valid complaint for a number of years. But, yeah, I, I would say essentially the idea is we're, we're trying to combine that data that is usable uh, paired with complaints. And we're trying to do, basically create a methodology for when complaints come in so that we're not trying to reactively fix everything um, dependent on the, the urgency of it. Um, you know, if we pull operations staff to go fix everything and it's not as urgent, it just, we put them further behind on the operation and maintenance that they have scheduled. And we also fail to get the economy of scale of doing larger sections. So it, it's going to be a combination of that. Yeah, it, it was a recent inventory, I'd say maybe five years ago. So I'm sure that it's all still relevant. Um, I also just want to add to that. Um, it actually just jogged my memory. I actually owe um, Matthew at RPC an update on sidewalks because every year he emails me and asks us which ones we've changed. So he does update things as we do projects like MCOR and whatnot. So it's not completely out of date completely, but I'm sure, you know, slower areas of the city where no one gets to for projects or even pedestrian usage where no one complains probably are older data yeah i suppose i mean with with roads at least you can argue that if we don't do some preventive maintenance it's going to cost twice as much in two years but there's not that sense of urgency with sidewalks because they tend not to deteriorate as fast as roads because they don't have you know buses and trucks riding on them and stuff so i'm I'm just concerned that sidewalks sometimes get pushed off because there's not that sense of urgency, but it'd be nice to see some kind of systematic plan for those. Other questions? Um, I, think, I think I got all mine. I'm saving a few for the, the next discussion on uh, that Carol's gonna lead, but. And I, is that next on our agenda? Yeah. So I guess we can go right into that if uh, if nobody else has any questions for Tim or Shannon. Great. Thanks a lot. And I really I do appreciate um, the approach that you guys are taking now, basically figuring out the life cycle of uh, how long things are going to last and how much underfunded <laughs> the whole capital infrastructure investment is, and and hopefully. We'll be able to get a handle on that soon. Okay, Carol. Hi. Hi, nice to see you. We miss you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I wanna give you a little bit of background on the, on the project I'm gonna talk about and then, um, and then outline what the mayor hopes will be your role in, um, in helping to execute the project. So first let me say, this has not yet been approved by the council because they're voting on the budget. Um, the committee, the whole vote's on the budget next Monday, and then the final vote by the council will be on the 28th. But, um, you know, when there's a new council elected, they, they, um, they come in in, in uh, I guess it's May, early May, 
and the, the budget is already very, very much underway. So um, notwithstanding that um, uh, several of us met with the, with the uh, all the council members as they were coming in and, and talking about general priorities and there were a couple of themes that came through and we were and we were going to try our best to be responsive to the themes that we heard so there were two themes that were coming through one was you know th that people had heard um very much from their constituents about you know investment in infrastructure and then the other was about you know about social equity racial equity types of things and so we had the opportunity um given that we had some um i'm not going to say extra fund balance, but we had fund balance beyond um, beyond pro pr proposing as a as a sort of a new um, threshold for for what what should be in our what we you know what you think of as a rainy day fund. And so we had this $2 million that we could devote to this project that we're calling the equity and quality of life project, which some of us um, abbreviate as EQL or EQOL and call equal or you'll hear it called EQL. <clears throat> so the idea behind that is that we, this $2 million would be uh, used to fund infrastructure projects in historically underserved neighborhoods, kind of like the, uh, uh, the parallel of what's happening with the um, Lumpkin Family uh, Fund grant that we got to fund um, tree planting in historically underserved um, areas. It's sort of a, you know, like, oh, wow, that's a, what a, what a great idea. There's all kinds of infrastructure investments that you can imagine um, that might need to happen. And, and one of the, and there were a couple of things that were recurring as, as things that were, people were hearing specifically in terms of infrastructure, and it's not exclusive to this, but sidewalks, which you guys have been talking about, and streetlights. And so, you know, one sort of sample that we're using as a sort of a reference point is, Last year, we did this lighting project that was about this 10 to 12 um, street lights along Kinch Street, and it had been it had been in the works, you know, you know, sort of like on the on the back burner, unfunded for I was told at 20 years, and we finally partnered with um, you know the the folks in you know when you get people talking across departments, you know, some good things can happen, and so finally said, you know, oh, we could use um, um, CDBG money, community development block grant money to do this, you know, the streetlight project. And then then we were able to do it last year. And the and the price tag was about, um, I think it was about $250,000, $225,000. And it, it's something that, you know, it, it's, it's not heavy on design. Um, and, you know, that's sort of like a, that's a chunk that can make a big difference in a neighborhood. So, so that's the idea is in these sort of, I'm gonna call them more bite-sized chunks. So I think of it as be, being between, maybe the scope of a, of a project would be between 200 and $500,000. You, you know, you wanna sort of spread things around um, that we could do a, a series of these and actually make change in some of these neighborhoods and, you know, and add, you know, add to safety in places where they might be struggling. And so the mayor was hoping that BPAC would take the lead on on sort of you know bringing a, a set of projects forward. And I could see it um, because I know you all are, you know you're very interested in Vision Zero. It would not be exclusively to advance Vision Zero, but it's layering in other things, right? Um, this idea of you know historically underserved and maybe thinking a little bit more broadly about what safety means. Um, but I could imagine that you know you would want to. I, I think of it as three different three different sort of phases that you could do. And and this is just me kind of high level thinking. If you if you all were willing to take this on, um, you might break it into you know a bunch of smaller pieces. But sort of the initial part of it would be okay. We have to figure out how are we going to sort of rack and stack project proposals and so it would be I, I would see it as sort of like a scoring system so somebody mentioned earlier you know there, there was a fatality on main street so you might you know you might give a, you know a high number of points if there had been a, a traffic accident or a fatality in that fatality might have been a shooting fatality and not just a traffic fatality but you know you might you might do that you might 
Um, you might give extra points if it's near a school or, or you know, you think of, a, of about a scoring system. And then um, after you develop, you know, sort of the guidelines about how you would, how you would um, evaluate projects, then put out a call for projects and, and figure out, you know, how to engage with different groups, um, neighborhood groups, or, um, you know, certainly the council members could assist in um, identifying projects and, you know, and, you know, there's all, there's all manner of how to do that. And then get it and then get a series of projects in there, which would have to, you know, there'd have to be some work done, very rudimentary work on defining a scope, because we don't want someone to come and say, oh, we want to do, you know, two miles of road and then that, that that's more than the, the whole budget will 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 bear. And then, um, and then do some kind of evaluation and make a set of recommendations based on the guidelines and based on the, you know, based on the projects that were presented. And then um, after at the end of that those would be a set of recommendations that would go to the mayor and um and the council for consideration and then if depending on how all that turned out we we then you know they would then translate into projects that we would design and and build so um that's that's what i'm here to talk about so i hope that's something that interests you all Any comments, questions? And these projects would specifically be infrastructure projects? Yes. A few thoughts come to mind initially. And one is all the discussions of neighborhoods around the United States that were historically redlined and how even decades later, they're still very, very incredible impacts of that and it parallels directly with what you're saying with the street trees because redlined neighborhoods typically didn't have so it's many street trees either and then i was also thinking of like stormwater infrastructure is not glamorous per se but has a huge impact on quality of life if your basement's flooding or you can't afford to take care of the flooding and so on um, and so I think that we should consider things like that, but maybe green infrastructure. So things that have environmental and human benefits and also things that have stormwater benefits too. Mm -hmm. Of course, I need to think on these things a whole lot more, but those are my initial thoughts. You know, um, if you talk to um, Council Member Hersey, who lives in uh, Dr. Ellis, she'll, t the, she'll tell you about how Dr. Ellis was built and how they, you know, they, they minimize the amount of Public infrastructure that was that was installed in the subdivisions initially. So no sidewalks, no street lights, no street trees. It was it was absolute minimum, and those things only were added over time compared to the white subdivisions that were going in that were sort of fully kitted out. And so it's it's absolutely illustrating just what you said, Kara. Uh, is the EQL, um, is the, you said that was a grant, um, with these no. projects, oh, okay. It's what, it, we, we've created a new project, a new capital project that we're calling the Equity and Quality of Life Project or the Equity and Quality of Life Projects. And that's, and that's being funded out of our general fund. So it sounds like this would be kind of a, uh, require a facilitated discussion and some, um, you know, some administrative work to collate, you know, the collate the thoughts and and put it together for proposals and stuff. Um, are we? Are, do you expect us to do that with our existing support? I think we can give you a, a little bit more support to to do it. I know it's additional work. And it doesn't necessarily have to come from from public works per se. Um, you know, I have Will Kolchowski, who is my right hand, and and I free him up for for different things. And this is really important. Um, it's a really important project for us. And you know, this is this at the moment. It's you know, we we can only see our way clear. We couldn't take on any any significant uh, recurring expenses um, this year because you know you know our lines were. We're, we're trying to get our lines to go in the right direction for um, the, the long-term budget, 
But, um, you know, it, we'd love to see this become a, a project that had recurring funding. But for now, $2 million is not an incidental amount of money. So, um, and I think this would be a great way to engage the community and, and, have, and have everyone in the community be thinking about how underinvested we are in certain areas. I mean, I, I can think of a lot of specific projects that um, have kind of been on the back burner over the years um, in a lot of these, a lot of the lower income or affected neighborhoods. Um, so I guess we'd have an opportunity to, to do that, to submit those. But yeah. you're asking us to more come up with the methodology and, and scoring and um, that sort of thing. Yeah. And so, and we're thinking maybe eight or 10 projects, something like that. I think, th I think that's probably about right, it, 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 depending on how, um, how ambitious they are. I mean, if they're modest, we can, you know, the, more, the more modest they are, the more we can do. And so I think that would be something that you would want to think about too. Um, and maybe that's, you, maybe you score projects, but then you, res you, know, you kind of think about, well, even though these scored a certain way, you know, we can do more of, you know, it, let's say they were A's, B's and C's. Even though we have these three A's that would take all the money, we could do 10 B's and so you might, you might decide that's how you want to recommend at the end um, to, to get them done. Actually, a good uh, model might, to start out with anyway, might be to look at how the ITEP projects were ranked because that um, had several criteria and, and um, then on the funding end, they also had a criteria for uh, assessing whether the neighborhood was at risk and um, things like that, but I, I didn't really like theirs because it used census tracts and our census tracts are so big, like, you know, you get Stone Creek and, and uh, Silver Water in the same census tract and that is hard to, uh, you know, <laughs> hard to determine what, the, what that census tract is. Um, so I, but I think it'd be good to kind of look at their methodology and maybe look at the projects that were submitted, I guess the park district and Forest Preserve District also submitted some projects that weren't um, funded. So maybe look at those. If they send results back, we could see what um, the comments on those were too. Um, I guess as an example of a small project and a big project, I was thinking that Church Street extension that was supposed to go through where, um, um, what's the name of that? Uh, the retreat. The treat um, at where Church Street goes across Lincoln, and then it kind of ends about 100 yards down where the retreat is. There used to be a dirt path that went on from there to, I guess, Church Street on the other side of about probably 200 yards. And then now I think it's fenced off, but they did build, build their part of the, the um, multi-use path there. But that was in the bike plan to originally continue that across. Um, and it was, since it was a dirt path, it was obviously used and um, now they can't use it. So that might be a small project. Of, um, and then the big project in that kind of same area is uh, the side path that's in the bike plan from Lincoln to, uh, well, along Lincoln from University up to Bradley. And that would probably be a multi-million thing by itself, don't you think? So that I think would, so. <laughs> so we might not be able to get that one and squeeze into this one. Um, well, especially when you think about the, um, well, unless you're going to use part of Lincoln Avenue right away, you're going to have to do property acquisition. Yeah, I think it was supposed to be on the west side. And there's some open space there. But yeah, I'm sure a lot of it's not owned. But I, there are some other small connections, too, that um, that need to be made. Um, what do people think? Are you up for a challenge to come up with this methodology? I just want to add one coincidental thing. I actually designed that bike path, the retreat before I came to the city. So when did you come to the city? I thought you've been here longer than that. I came in October, 2018. So right when the retreat was oh, okay. being built. I thought you'd been here like a decade or something. <laughs> not, not yet. You act like you've been here forever. <laughs> okay. 
Well, uh, I think it would be an, a really interesting challenge. I, th I think it would, I'd be interested in it. I, I do have one question. I listened to a bunch of budget stuff and, and some of those, some of the meetings from whatever day that was last week, I think the seventh. And there was talk, some talk about um, possibly adding cameras. And I didn't know if that would be totally in a, a different budget than this. Well, I mean, I know it's not, it's not something that's, um, well, it's just something that a neighborhood would like. And I think it actually is a good idea for, for safety reasons. But would that be part of this project or would that be from a, a different budget, do you think? At the moment, um, there, there has, as, as you observed, there, there's been some talk there. The council really hasn't had a, a conversation about where they are collectively about wh whether that's something that they want to pursue. We haven't done any kind of, and until they do, we're not really um, going to be doing a lot of research into cost because if they don't support it, there's no reason to do the, the investigation into cost. Um, I think there was some desire that at least some of the of this um, equity and quality of life money could could fund that. Um, I think that would also depend on you know I don't know what kind of dollars we might be talking, but that could get folded in at some point. You know um, where if if they want to deploy that, that might be okay. Where and that could just be put into the mix of okay. It rem I think it remains to be seen how that might how that might be influenced, but it could be like if that's what you want, you, you want cameras in your neighborhood, and the council says if people want them, you know, we'll we'll allow it. Then they might just submit those as projects. Okay, but that could, would there be another? I mean, it seemed to me there. I'm sorry, I just got I kind of dazed out on it. Seemed like there were three or four acronyms for budgets and I wasn't sure if that was that would be part of this or if it would have been in one of the other budgets I mean I just I you know I I kind of got lost in all of that but it's, it's could a, it come from some other budget or would it be specifically this <laughs> I, that remains to be seen let me just say that that it remains to be seen okay okay that's fair enough <laughs> Thank you for watching the budget um, <laughs> budget discussions, though. Do, do you have a target time frame where you'd like to um, start receiving suggestions or proposals? Well, the fiscal year starts on July one, so um, and you know, given that there's going to be all the the vetting that's going to you know we're going to have to come up with the you know the um, the methodology give people time to submit projects, evaluate the projects and so forth. And then, and then starts the work to actually get them done. So, um, you know, the sooner the better, but you wanna give people a fair shot at, um, at giving them an opportunity to submit projects and stuff. So, um, and, and to submit projects that are, that have some, you know, competitiveness, you know, uh, based on whatever the methodology is. So, um, I mean, yeah. I imagine it would take us a few meetings. So I agree. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Oh, yeah. Carol, do you think uh, council would have to approve the scoring system that we came up with? I mean, I think that's something that you might want to get feedback, whether you know to say approve it. Um, I, 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 I don't, I don't think they'd have to approve it. Ultimately, you know, the, I, I don't know how we would even, you know, they don't, they don't even really, you know, once they approve um, a project like. I'll just give an example, like you've been talking about, you know, sidewalk improvement projects or things. Here's a pot of money to do some stuff. I don't know that they would even approve the individual projects, but I think you'd want to keep, you know, periodically circling back um, and getting feedback. So, especially since it's a new thing, you know. Yeah, and I can imagine um, there might be duplicates, so I, I wonder if it would be possible to make them public as they're submitted, or would that be a bad idea? So that people can just say, yeah, I like that one. I don't need to submit another one just like it. <laughs> well, um, I think 
as they're submitted, I mean, I, I don't have a problem with the transparency of that, but um, they might need some work to, to scope them, you know, so that we have a sense of what is this instead of like, um, you know, my block needs street lights. It's like, okay, well, what exactly are we talking about? Are we talking about two intersections? Are we talking about just mid block? You know, so I think we're gonna have to do some, you know, some um, clarification even as they come in. So they'll come in and then they'll need a little bit of work to, you know, kind of give them, give them four, four clear corners. So but maybe, um, maybe try to target, um, I would say a one page application or something like that so they, they can fill out. So a neighborhood, a neighborhood group could easily do several or an individual could, um, but more than just like a, a one liner or a email or something, but. Yeah, and I, I think you wanna give some thought to, um, you know, do, the, do you want them to have to show any level of support um, from the neighborhood or from the, from the, the immediate area? So um, they have a very elaborate um, system in the, the jurisdiction where I worked before this. They have a whole program called neighborhood conservation and people, you know, you, you have to do a whole neighborhood plan. And then if you do a neighborhood plan, then you could submit projects. And then at what, whatever you know, block you're in, you have to get so many signatures of people on the block. I'm not suggesting anything like that. But you might want to think, do you have to show any kind of neighborhood support? Or is it just like, hey, I have an idea. So let because level of neighborhood support might be one of the one of the criteria you want to use. Hmm. It could, and it could be like a maybe a phase one and phase two where some projects are preliminary approved and then they could um, further justify them in phase two or something. Yeah. I think maybe some of the campus um, sustainability grants work some, some way like that. That's another model we could look at. Mm -hmm. Other comments? If, uh, if not, is there a, a motion to make this official if we're gonna take this on? Come on, people, this is exciting. <laughs> uh, sure, I guess I'll move that we um, make a motion to have the BPAC create a scoring system that can be used to evaluate uh, submitted proposals for uh, public improvement projects related to safety and uh, equity and quality of life. I'll second it, but I'm not repeating everything Jeff just said. <laughs> <laughs> you don't need to. Okay, thanks. There's, it's been moved by Jeff Marino and seconded by Shannon to do that. Um, any discussion on that? It sounds like a lot of work, but I think it'll be pretty valuable. Okay, I guess, I guess. Um, maybe one thing, Bill, that I would be nervous about would be uh, the outreach to the neighbors or the neighborhood or the city in general and how we get those um, projects back or how do we get the, the submittals back and, you know, what if we put together this awesome scoring system, but then we have trouble getting it out, get the word out that we need these submittals, and then we only have a handful of submittals that maybe aren't what we envisioned um, for the for the project. Uh, but I guess it's one of those things that we'll have to work through that as we get to it. Yeah, I mean, I think I think some other stuff. Uh, there's other stuff going on with um, the comprehensive plan where they're doing outreach, so they could we could probably tag on to some of that. Uh, council members, you know, make sure council members are, if they want projects in their wards, they need to get people to submit projects. We can submit our own ideas. I think I had a list of nine I was willing to talk about, but we aren't gonna go there tonight. So um, we can submit our own or we could get other people to submit them too. So yeah, I understand what you're saying, but um, I think we could work through it. I think so. Okay, ready to vote? 
Okay, could we have a roll call? Bill Brown? Yes. Shannon Branick? Yes. Kara Dudek? Yes. Jeff Marino? Yes. Sarathak Prasad? Yes. Nancy Westcott? Yes. That makes it unanimous. Thank you. That passes. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. And feel free to stick around if you have time. I am going to, and um, you'll probably see me more because as we work through this, um, I, I intend to stay involved because I'm really excited about this project. So thank you. Okay, and, and I promise we don't go to 11 o'clock. We have a, a hard cutoff at nine, and I, I think we might even beat that tonight. If you do, I will be so thrilled because we were we were at uh, council until 11 o'clock last night. So I need okay. my food to sleep. <laughs> and did you start at six yesterday? Yes. Oh my gosh. Have some mercy. <laughs> All right. Thank okay, you. thanks. Okay, next is uh, Jason Santos going to present a demo of um, a mapping survey. Do you want to just kind of introduce yourself yeah. and explain yes, um, what your what your goals were here? Yeah, my name is Jason Santos. I was um, I'm a senior at Eastern Illinois University, and I was brought on by Cynthia Hoyle to assist her with the Vision Zero project she has going on. And we've been working with this uh, wiki mapping uh, survey tool um, for a little bit now. I've been handling most of it. And basically what it is, is a um, it's a tool that will give uh, the residents of Urbana um, a public map to really share um, their uh, perspectives and concerns um, on specific locations within the city. Um, let me pull it up, share my screen. Okay. Uh, so this is a public project and all the visitors who come to the site will be able to see all the inputs and comments that people have left. Um, and with this data uh, that's collected from the public, uh, will help us identify, you know, places uh, within Urbana um, where transportation infrastructure uh, can be improved and uh, identify barriers, uh, problems, and safety concerns. So this is the first pop-up that will, people will see or visitors will see when they um, come on the page. This is kind of a, a draft of uh, what uh, we're looking to put out there. Uh, publish. Um, if you want to take a second to read that. And um, so you can use an email to log in and log in will just uh, allow you to uh, keep track of the comments you've made and just to keep up with uh, the rest of the project. But I'll continue as a guest to bring me in here. Okay, so I put down an example uh, for each of inputs that uh, people are gonna be able to make. So we have uh, two types of routes that individuals can draw. One is a route they currently take and another is a route that they would like to take. And we have four points that people can leave um, for different um, things such as barrier to biking, driving, um, if they've been in an incident, they can leave that there um, and a barrier to walking. And each point and route comes with a, a survey uh, for them to answer. So I put in this example of someone who uh, wanted to leave a comment for a route that they want to take. I can hover over it. It gets real small. So they said a protected bike lane would give cyclists a safe route on Main Street. Um, and what's, what's really cool about the route is that you're able to draw exactly your, uh, from your starting point um, one second, to wherever you'd like to go, um, street by street and every corner. And if there are hidden, um, like alleyways that you take, you can go through that as well. 
And once you're done drawing your route, you, um, you're given a survey and you can uh, leave whatever comment or concern you'd like. So, you know, maybe um, uh, lighting isn't good at night. And for you want to leave this for walking and you can leave that. And everyone who visits the page will be able to see what you've left. Um, and let me give you an example of a point that you can leave. Yeah, let's say an incident. Uh, say it happened right here. This pops up. Just say here this by vehicle, and then you can leave the date of when this happened. There you go. So it really allows people to, um, you know, see. I'll leave their issues that they have and see what other um, neighbors, you know, uh, have to say about um, Urbana as well. Um, any questions? Um, yes. Yeah, so when people open it up, is it um, the map they see blank and they get to start drawing on it or will they see everybody else's? And will Yeah, they will see everyone else's. Um, all so these can, vectors and routes you see, they'll be able to see that once they enter the page. Seems like it might get a little cluttered. Yeah, um, there's uh, other cities uh, with Vision Zero have done this type of map and it gets cluttered, but it really shows you how much is, you know, um, how many things that uh, are not going so well in the city. I guess um, we also want to avoid um, people expecting this to be submitted as sort of a maintenance issue that's going to be responded to right away or something. We need to make clear that um, actually it would probably help to in, on the introductory screen to have some kind of note about if you have a immediate concern about a maintenance issue, go to this website. We have a citizen's voice form they can use to submit issues. Um, so something like that probably on the startup would be good. Um, the other thing I thought about is uh, it kind of assumes or requires a little bit of knowledge of infrastructure. It'd be also it'd be nice to have another maybe maybe one of the options handles this. I, I'd have to look at it again. It'd be nice for somebody to just say I feel uncomfortable here. I feel I I don't feel safe using this this uh you know bike lane or whatever does one of the one of the options handle that um you know they all give you uh the room to really uh, say whatever you feel um under a specific point or route so um let's see if i have an example here So I have nothing specific on that, but uh, you, you know, I, maybe I should um, add that into the opening tab um, where you can really just leave any comments you have or feelings. So I have a comment, I mean, a few comments actually. So uh, one thing that I've um, heard from our GIS staff at the UPI is uh, we don't want people to give two subjective answers because of consistency issues. So like when you're analyzing the data that you are collecting here, you'll have long answers and it will be difficult for you to just analyze them, right? Like somebody says that uh, it would be the same kind of thing that there was a near miss at this in intersection or lighting is not good in at this intersection, but two people will uh, word that comment in a different way. So there is that consistency issue. Now, the second thing is I agree with Bill that it will get cluttered a lot. Like uh, let's say there are a hundred people who have taken the survey. Um, it may, because when you hover over one of these, uh, routes, it will show you a comment from somebody else. Let's say I took a route from Green Street um, 
onto First Street over uh, to FNS. And there are 10 other people who took the same, or let's just say one other person took the same route. If um, I'm entering a comment, there is another comment at that location. It may seem cluttered, like, uh, you know what I mean? Yeah, uh, no, I, I totally understand. And, you know, yeah. pretend, pretend someone did, you take the same route. They yeah. are able to leave um, a comment under this, uh, the original comment. And, you know, I, I get, I get that it can be cluttered. Um, but when you're zoomed out, it's really, yeah. everything looks, it can look cluttered. But once you zoom in, things can get separated. But I get it. Yeah. Uh, more than one um, uh, individual or more than, uh, you know, quite a bit of people put, you know, left something right here, then it can really get cluttered. Yeah. And uh, even for the same uh, point of uh, like intersection points, let's say at this particular location where you are, at, let's say somebody um, mentioned that there was a uh, collision there somebody else wants to uh, add another collision at the same location. You don't really know if it's the same collision that they're talking about or it's um, a different one. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So uh, there, I mean, uh, I would prefer like uh, as a user of this uh, map, even though like having, uh, or just a reference of others or like how they have uh, entered the survey, it would be nice to see that. But if I have a clear uh, map, it would be um, easier for me to take the survey. So, and, the, and on the background, like anyone who has the administrative uh, um, authority for this map itself, they'll see all the results and hopefully like they can extract all that information in Excel sheet or however way they can. So that's my comment here. Like one consistency, two cluttered, three uh, possibility of duplicates and uh, missing collisions at the same locations. So these three main points. By the way, I really like this design. Did you come up with that or is that? Yeah, so <laughs> yeah, I did come up with the banner. That's uh, really awesome. Yeah, thank you. Um, but yeah, no, thank you for your, your uh, feedback. And you know what, I, I hear you. And I think what we can do is really create more specific survey um, questions for them to answer to really lock down uh, specific events and incidents. But you can filter off, you know, turn off what you know what oh yeah that's good so you, you get this and then you want to see just that just to be uh, like just another comment on that yeah. so I, uh, I was at the there is a walk by places conference going on like that started today so they were just talking about accessibility so uh, not a lot of people or a small percentage of uh your audience is going to know that you can actually uh, hide some layers <laughs> or how to do that. You're right, you're right. That, that was hidden off in the corner. <laughs> yeah, so it's, it, it's important to uh, either you can give them an instruction sheet, like uh, if you want to do this, uh, you can do it like that or make it simpler for them. Yeah, this is just, you know, a little building block to really grow on. Um, Nothing's fully set here, but just, you know. Yeah, one way might be just to do like a, a one minute YouTube video demo, quickly going through where things are and how to turn them on and off and do a couple of examples. So then you could have that on the landing page too. say, you know, two minute overview on how to use our map or something like that. And they just watch the demo video, something like no, that. No, I really like that idea. That's, that's a good one. I'll definitely keep that one in mind. And yeah, you know, when I look at this, you know, for the first tab that pops up, I, I think I really do need to add more, uh, more direction for visitors. So that's, take advantage of that. 
Plus, I would make the the ad points, ad routes, those things more bold or a bigger font, so it's more prominent. And have you and Cynthia or, or anyone else talked about how we'll be using this data? And if the object on uh, putting in the blue lines where they currently go is to see, you know, sort of current usage patterns, then you'd probably want duplicates so that the same people, so that, you know, you'd see, <laughs> ideally you'd see the line get thicker or darker or something and more people put their lines on there. But, um, you know, I guess my question is make sure that um, everything we're asking people to do is stuff that we'll be able to use in the end. Yeah, um, you know, I'm so I'm not too well informed on exactly what she wants to do with the data. I am kind of a short term intern and this a lot of this stuff is new to me. I'm in public health. So just uh, doing what I can, you know, for you guys. Um, wow, you learned how to do GIS on wiki maps and you're, you, this is, you've never done this before? No, I've never done this before. All right, good job. <laughs> Appreciate it. Um, but, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll relay some of that to Cynthia for sure. Do you, will Cynthia be notified every time somebody makes a, um, an addition to the map? Um, so through our account, we can see, uh, I wonder if, can you, can you guys see this? Did I open it? Can you see my new tab I opened? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So yeah, uh, now there's no notifications, but we, you know, as we log in as an um, admin, we can see all the comments that people left um, and the dates of when they were left there. Um, and we can also filter out, uh, you know, specific ones like uh, what I just put right here. So, yeah, we'll be able to see it's uh, you know exact things, but nothing. Um, I don't think we'll get notified per um, comment left or point left. So, I w yeah, I wonder if um, the comments would need to be moderated at all. Uh, if somebody wrote some like some person said, "Hey, I almost got in an accident here," and then the other person said, "That's because you're a bad driver or bad <laughs> pedestrian," and then they're like, "No, I'm not." if Cynthia will go in and have to clean that out or something, or and then they'll be like, hey, that was my first amendment right. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but, you know, we would have to look at every single comment that was left, um, you know, one by one, so. Yeah, I've seen other maps where you can just upvote it and downvote uh, a comment rather than like commenting on the comment, but. Yeah, so I, I we can add that in there too. Um, I just, you know, this is just something rough, but. I think that might work better than leaving a comment over another one. Yeah, and then it gets to Sarthok's comment. Then you can see, you know, this one comment had 20 upvotes rather than this comment had 20 comments on it that, you know, supported it. Because then it's a little less general about whether they agree with it or not. Yeah. That's a good idea. And how long? So, are you just here for the summer then? Or are you yeah. pre finished? Yeah. Finishing up? At the end of July. Yeah. Yeah. Just to echo what Bill said, I think this is awesome. And uh, I'm really impressed that you learned how to do this so quickly. And I don't, you know, uh, the BPAC's working on a very tiny budget, <laughs> uh, no, not non existent budget. So, to be able to get, put this together with intern help is just amazing. No, it's great. I mean, I love the experience and, you know, it's still related to public health. So I'm, I'm really in it. Uh, I'll just make, well, two comments. One, I agree. This map is like the most readable map I've seen in a while. I really, I really like it, but I also, I have very poor vision. So I invert the colors. So, you know, if you have a labeling on the map, then they will all invert, you know. If, um, but if you have separate text and you refer to a blue line or a green line or a red, I won't, the colors will be inverted from what I see because I changed the background to black instead of white. And so when I invert the colors, then I never know what text I'm supposed to look at or, you know, what the text means if it's not on the map. 
if you under if you kind of get that. Yeah. Um, you know, I I would have to uh, reach out to the consultant to work on that one. I'm not too familiar with all the changes I can make with the map, but that's a good yeah, point. Well, it, yeah. Yeah, it's only the text that would make any difference. You know, the text outside of the map, like, you know, if, if someone describes the map in a paragraph somewhere else, then I won't be able to relate to the colors necessarily. Okay. Yeah, but, so it's, instead of saying the blue line, I, sh I should say the solid line versus the dashed line, something like that. I see. Okay. Yeah. So it's not the map itself is fine because it'll automatically invert the colors so I can to something else. And the the labeling will be fine if if the labeling is created by the, the map program. It's it's just a separate, you know, text somewhere else. I I, I have problems with sometimes. Um and so just uh, one more thing. So everyone can access this on their you know, computer browser, but you can also access it through your phone um, browser as well. Um, you won't see the banner, but you will see the map and you can leave you know, points and routes still. So there's that to it. Well, thanks. This is a really good start, I think. I know. Uh... Cynthia has a small grant. She was going to go ahead and pay whatever you have to for Wiki Maps, I guess, to get the license. Um, so I think this will be a good start of something we can really work with. Yeah. Yeah, thank you guys. We got a lot to put onto this, but I think uh, I can really put it together. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Okay, let me see where we are on the agenda. Okay. Um, announcements. Yeah, go ahead, Sarthak. Yeah, I have a few announcements. Okay, so for um, Bike to Work Day, we are going to have Bike to Work Day on Tuesday, September 14th from 7 to 10 a.m. And uh, um, yeah, and more details will come as as soon as I have more <laughs> details. But um, I'm personally I'm looking to add a couple of um, couple more stations at the university, at um, National Soybean Research Center that's on Pennsylvania and Dorner, so that there is a location uh, there because since the bike center moved from Pennsylvania to Gregory, there's nothing. Uh, no welcoming station uh, on Pennsylvania, and I'm trying to trying to convince WetMed to host one uh, location as well because there's absolutely no uh, uh, location, no welcoming station anywhere near WetMed or um, like on that side, like near Arboretum or Orchard Downs or that area. So that's about bike to work day. And again, like more information will come maybe next month or uh, something. Um, for light the night, we are going to do uh, light the night on the same day, like September 14th from uh, 4 p.m. to 7 p.m. And we'll again use the three locations, Holly Gateway, uh, Alma Mater Plaza and uh, Campus Bike Center on Gregory Drive as the three locations. Um, and yeah, again, uh, we'll have more details when, um, like, we'll have more details soon. So that's the, uh, that's about, but uh, the other thing that I can give you some more information on is the walkability audit. So I am looking into uh, conducting a thorough walkability audit of the campus, um, actually the university district in FY22, hopefully, like I don't have a hard set deadline, but um, I am collaborating with a, a 
professor in urban and regional planning department um, and hopefully we'll have a master's student um, who can uh, collaborate with me as their capstone project uh, for the walkability audit. And yeah, so that's that's uh, what's going on uh, with, these are the three main projects that I have. Uh, anything else? About the eco counters, uh, but the, they will be installed on right and Healy and like the two additional um, eco counters that we have, they should be installed um, later in the summer, hopefully, but before the students come back. Um, so one will be at uh, Wright and Healy, the other one will be at Armory and Sixth. So yeah, eco counters are the bicycle and pedestrian uh, counters. But, um, mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. That's September 14th. Yes, and uh, the grand reopening of Campus Bike Center will also happen. I think they're talking about doing it during the week, like throughout the week, um, but um, they're planning on doing it um, the same. Uh, during the same, uh, like same time as uh, late the night and bike work day we're calling kind of calling it the bicycle day so it, it may be uh, interesting like in the morning it will be bike to work day during in the afternoon maybe uh, grand reopening celebration for bike center and in the later afternoon or uh, evening late the night okay thanks other announcements yes um, on the ITEP, um, they did release the funding last uh, last week, Thursday or Friday, I think. And the good news is Savoy finally, Savoy submitted a, um, a project that was actually submitted several years ago on South First Street between Windsor and Curtis. It's um, really gonna be a, a good project because that's a narrow street. And south of there and north of there, it's really easy to ride your bike and, and that's a main way to get you know, out, out in the country from campus and from a lot of lot, part, lot of parts of town. But that's a narrow, speedy speedway there, and there is plenty of room. Um, the U of I has property, so it must have in, uh, incorporated some intergovernmental agreements and things or cooperation to get the U of I property for the side path. But that was a million dollar plus, I think, maybe it's close, I forget exactly what it was, but that, that got funded, so that's great. Champagne got a little funding up by Moreland um, to continue a, a bike path up there. It was yeah. less than 100,000 100, or so. It was, yeah, technically the park district. Oh, okay. Yeah, but it will link, uh, there's a trail that goes behind Menards and it goes then to the west side of GFS and then it links into the, so kind of a, a link between two existing trails. Great. And then I guess the um, Forest Preserve and Park District didn't get funded and all it said was application incomplete. You know anything about that, Kara? No, we've been trying to find out more. Um, the people that we've called so far just um, passed us on to some other people, but I am curious to find out because I feel like I put my soul into that application and yeah. I'd like a little bit more info. <laughs> yeah, that's gotta be disappointing. Um, yeah, I was wondering if there's a way to get, you know, there's, they have a scoring system to see how each project scored, or at least, you know, I'd be interested to see how the Urbana project scored in the different areas to see where maybe we didn't communicate good enough in some areas, or maybe we could pick a different project next time that would score better in those areas. But, um, it'd be interesting. I, I wonder if we can get a kind of a breakdown of how, how the scoring because they scored, you know, different aspects of it. Yeah, so if, we, if we find a good contact and are able to get that information, I could pass that along. Okay. Great. Oh, and also Savoy uh, accepted four of the three-foot passing signs. They're putting up four that um, 
were donated by Prairie Cycling, Prairie Cycling Club? No, Champaign County Bikes. Plus they're buying two more. So they're putting up six of those three foot passing signs. That's good news. Any other announcements? I, I just remembered one more. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, the bike shelter is finally done. Uh, the bike shelter has been installed uh, near Flag Hall um, in Champaign, right south of, uh, yeah, it's no, north of Flag Hall uh, in the SCRP location. So, um, yeah, if you guys are on campus, um, it'd be, you, you can check it out. It's finally done like it's it took us like two two years or something <laughs> to figure out uh, with all the manufacturing issues engineering issues location huh. issues it's finally done where is it north of uh, it, uh, it's um it's so if you go uh south, Gregory? uh just uh, let me I think Gregory is the street that runs along the north side of STR. Yeah, at the intersection of Gregory and Ford. So okay. south of, uh, when you go south uh, from there, uh, Flag Hall is. Oh, Flag Hall, yeah, okay. That's yeah. one of those old four-story dorms, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but uh, it's finally done, so. Cool. Yeah, yes. <laughs> Well, one other piece of good news that I, you probably already know is that U of I Extension is going to build a new building in the Arboretum. So I think that's going to be fabulous for Urbana. I think so too. I think it, that'll get that probably get that um, path across that we tried to get sustainability funding for a couple of years ago to connect the um, uh, Hazelwood. Hazelwood, is that it, Nancy, that goes to? Yeah, I think it's Hazelwood. Yeah. I mean, it's a dirt path now. Um, I mean, it's a gravel path to the Arboretum that turns to dirt eventually to get to the research park. Um, but it would be nice to have that concrete through the Arboretum and see, use clear around. And we did submit an application for that, or we didn't, but the same, uh, we support, we sent a letter of support for that before. So I think that'll help get that along um yeah and then similarly if the urbana um rec center on washington um once that gets going i think that'll improve the possibility of getting some of the paths in weaver park don't you think kara um so i think when you have some construction near nearby you get more destinations and things and more justification to build the paths Yeah, thanks for bringing that up. Any other announcements? Okay, that's all I can think of. Um, did we have anything else on the agenda? Let's see. Oh, future topics. Well, I would guess we'd want to talk about the scoring system at the for the EQL equity and quality of life at the next meeting, unless. Do we want people to like brainstorm uh, scoring, um, you know, things, I don't know what the word is, attributes prior to the meeting and then come to the meeting prepared to discuss it? Or I don't know how we, you'd want to do that. I mean, because we can't, we can't discuss outside of the public hearing uh, too much. You can yeah, break into groups, I, mean, I guess. And we could have a committee. Um, I think. We'll probably have that on the agenda of the next two or three meetings at least. Maybe, uh, uh, I hate to commit too much, but I think I could, I could put together at least a list of maybe suggest links to other similar systems that we could look at. And people could kind of do some homework by looking at those scoring systems. Um, And maybe, I don't, I don't know, Carol, do you think it would be possible to put together a little like a half pager kind of um, of things for people to think about before our next meeting? Sure. Or how, is that a good approach, do you think? Or can you think a different way to? 
Yeah, I mean, um, one one thing to do might be if people wanted to send me ideas and then I can organize it and then you'd have something to react to. If you want to do it that way. And then I'll, I can add in, you know, I can add in ideas of my own because I, I've, you know, like I was telling you um, where I used to work, they had a kind of a robust program with a with the scoring system and if you want to make if you want to just send me um you know some of those some of those different grants or whatever that uh, you had ideas about and then we can just have it all compiled and then you could decide yes no and you know whatever that'd be great okay okay thanks send it to me and it's um cj mitten at urbana illinois.us Any other future topics? I, I am just curious about how University Avenue is coming and if, you know, if by the next meeting, maybe it will be done. Well, we are supposed to meet in person next meeting. That's kind of an announcement I'll mention. Ooh. I think that's still a little tentative, but hopefully we will. Um, Shannon, do you know, can you tell us, Anything about University Avenue? Um, just by being a normal Urbana driver, I noticed they are starting in the median removal, I want to say uh, on Cunningham and Broadway. Um, they still don't have the street lights in, so it's definitely not going to be by next month. They'll be done. Um, once they get all the street lights in, they'll finish up the sidewalk and then they'll start paving, which is still scheduled to be night paving to help minimize traffic impact. So. This could be a while. Yeah, they. Um, I talked to the RE uh, Evaristo about a month ago, and he did say they're a little behind, but the way the schedule was built, um, they actually have it, they can go all the way through November. So they're hoping not to take that long, but they do have that option. Okay, thanks. Okay, if you think of any other future topics, let me know. I'm sure Audrey and Cynthia will have some and um, we'll probably have a vision zero on there for an, a while still until we get the task force going. Um, okay, so thanks a lot everyone and thanks for making the quorum <laughs> so we could vote on, oh, you know what? I wonder if we should approve the minutes. Uh, let's just do it next time. So, okay, all right. And thank you, Jason. Thanks for coming. This meeting is adjourned.